Um, and today she's going to talk to us about the issue of, of racism as a public health crisis. So it's my pleasure to introduce Danielle Twemlow. I'm gonna click got it here. Well, thank you for that kind introduction and thank you for having me today. Um, I do want to point out that um, I'm here as an advocate, not necessarily representing any um, organization or group or anything of that sort. Um, I become involved in the community, um, seeking justice, seeking answers, um, oftentimes via the way of data policy. And then it often does lead me to uh, be involved. Oh, up a little bit more. Is that better? <laughs> often leads me to be involved um, in many different uh, organizations or groups, um, and I, I do chair some of those as well. So today, I hope to um, open this conversation about racism as a public health crisis. And I've actually already had people say, I never thought about racism as a health issue. Um, and we're going to kind of talk about um, some of the data and then kind of what we can do from here. So how did this kind of effort begin here locally? Um, the Shawnee County Health Department has a race equity impact analysis group that was started back um, after 2017 by Edith Gaines. Um, we, many of us were sitting here in this room where we received our health rankings from um, our epidemiologist, Dr. Pizzino at the time. Um, during that presentation, we heard some very staggering, some very concerning information about our infant mortality rate, about our years of life lost for residents. And what was even more so concerning is that was really dominantly black and brown people in our community. And that disproportion was huge. Um, and that kind of led some efforts and Edith Gaines began this race equity impact analysis group where a group of community members came together um, to review policy and procedures within, that, within the health department. And that was literally combing through reading policy and asking some five basic questions, which these are questions from um, many of you might have um, heard of Race Matters that kind of came to Topeka. We did a they did a presentation shortly after um, that um, 2017 um, community health uh, presentation. And so the Race Matters Institute has basic questions you can ask when deciding policies and procedures. Are all racial ethnic groups who are affected by policy practice decisions at the table? How will the proposed policy practice decision affect each group? How will it be perceived by each group? Does the policy and practice decision worsen or ignore existing disparities? And based on these responses, what revisions are needed to be put into place. So in order to do any of that, we have to know what those disparities are, right? And that takes a really conscious look at what is happening within our own community. And that's hard to do, right? It's hard to acknowledge that this isn't just a problem happening everywhere else, that we see those numbers here. So, I think it's really important too to understand that there's definitely a difference between equality and equity, right? And oftentimes those terms get used interchangeably, which is not accurate and it's not, it's not helpful either. We really can't move forward when we don't really understand and use a shared language, right? And that's one of the very first things the REIA group did was develop um, a set of, of universal language that we could all understand, such as structural uh, racism, right? Systemic racism. Um, how do policy practices and decisions impact housing, income, healthcare, education, public safety, transportation, food access? Um, and, and we developed a shared um, definition for all of those things. And there's a lot of different definitions, right? So finding those trusted sources from places that are really doing the work can be very helpful. 
Um, and then we did our own implicit bias recognition. We, we learned a little bit more about what implicit biases we carry, the, the traits that we have that we might be bringing to the table when looking at these policies, um, practices, and procedures. So equality um, and equity. So equality is giving everyone the same thing, right? And as we can see, um, the kiddo in blue um, is a lot taller, right? That's that's absolutely not something that he can change. That's not, um, you know, by his own doing. He just is a taller, taller kiddo. Um, the kiddo in purple is as just shorter. Again, not anything he can change. Not anything he can do about anything about. Um, but certainly, we are not able to enjoy the game in the same way. Um, in this in this piece. So giving everyone the same thing doesn't mean that they will have the same outcome. So equity is recognizing that, right? Equity is recognizing that sometimes we need to do a little bit more to get everyone at the same level, right? So the kiddo in purple receives two crates so he can see the game um, really, really well. And, and the kiddo in blue, he just, he doesn't really need anything. He's doing okay. He can stand there and see it all right. And kiddo in red only needs one. But then we have to acknowledge the reality, right? And the reality is the kiddo in blue has been able to um, pull those crates for a really long time. He's been coming to this game for months. He's He's been able to come and see this game. So every time he grabs a crate and he's able to stack taller and taller and taller because he's had more um, ability to do so. He's had more access to this game. He's maybe been here more times. Um, whereas we can see the kiddo on the purple might even be stuck in a hole, right? Things have not not only not gone his way, but things have kind of taken away from him. He's not even starting at the same level as all the other kiddos. Um, and of course, liberation, the ultimate goal would be to remove all barriers, right? Access is available to everyone at the same way, right? But that takes a level of understanding reality, providing equitable solutions to liberate everyone. So let's look at some of our, our local numbers. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a data person. I like to see the numbers. Um, and if we, we take from our, our study, so, so those of you who maybe aren't as um, familiar with data or like data as much as I do, data kind of comes in usually a five-year rolling uh, level, right? So we're always a couple years behind. We we take about five years on average, three to five years to really get a good set of numbers. So um, while some of this might say 2020, that could be the, the most current accurate data that we have available. Um, so from the um, 2020 housing study that was done here in Topeka, uh, they found that in order to have a safe and decent quality two bedroom unit to live in, someone would need to make roughly $16 an hour, right? So we know that um, that is, you know, more than double what our minimum wage is. Um, even a really, you know, what often people will, will find as a, a decent job at that 10 or $12 is not cutting it. If we pull up the MIT living wage calculator, which was um, more so uh, updated here just last April, um, that, that 1680 something an hour is for one person. So when we add in an adult, maybe a single parent with two children, we're looking at requiring $39.56 an hour to afford living in Topeka. Two adults, two children, thirty-six ninety an hour, with with one person working. Okay, so we we know that many of our jobs are not paying that. Um, many of our our families um, are not able to get that, and and many people who are living off of social security um, are still not pulling in um, that that sixteen dollars an hour. 
So when we break that down even a little bit more, um, we know that that means 52% of African-American people in our community are unable to afford a safe and decent quality two-bedroom home, 52%. 36% of our Hispanic fam people, it doesn't even mean they have a family, um, and 31% of white individuals in our community. That's a very staggering number. And this was 2020, right? We know things have changed. Um, I personally pull a little bit of um, hesitation with the narrative that our poverty rates have gone down that is a statement that's been released over and over again. Um, but when we pull the data from individual communities, that is definitely not what we see when we pull the census data in communities on the east side of town, um, the central part of town, where sometimes we're seeing uh, poverty numbers upwards of 38, 39% in census blocks. Right. Um, we know that um, those of us working in social services um, are seeing an increase in, in families um, accessing food pantries, um, energy assistance, those types of things. That number is definitely not going down. What we did see in 2020, however, um, was a large amount of unemployment. And if you remember, there was some backlash that unemployment was paying a living wage. We were also receiving stimulus payments, extra money for many families. So by an, a larger number of people receiving unemployment benefits at a living wage on top of supplemental money from the government, well, are we seeing reduced poverty for that year? Then I think maybe we're on to something. But again, we have to accept the reality of was this a cause? Right? So I'm not quite sure we're there yet. Um, so there's another really important piece that I want people to um, really pay attention to when we're talking about housing, and that's the term affordable housing. Okay, so affordable housing is very different than um, thinking about HUD levels. HUD housing is um, a subsidized, subsidized government housing. Um, they have um, a set income level that they work off of, um, as well as a term called fair market value, which is kind of analyzing, um, you know, rent and mortgage in an area um, with some averaging numbers, right? So kind of a little complicated. But what those do not take into account is individual incomes and individual situations. It's kind of more of a blanket number based on poverty rates and levels. So when we talk about affordable housing, that is housing that someone spends on rent and utilities, for example, um, that does not exceed 30% of their household income. No more than 30% of their household income. So that's, that's a fair amount. And what we found is that according to our census, the current 2020 US census, 44.8% of renters are spending more than 30% of their household income on rent. That's before utility rate increase that is proposed. Right? So we're already having nearly half of our renting population cost burdened. They're unable to make ends meet. So when we're spending 30% or more on rent and utilities, that's less money for food. That's less money for basic needs. That's less money for uh, doctor's visits, dental visits. Um, and people are having to make some pretty hard decisions. And more so, we know that that impact is happening disproportionately uh, within our black and brown population. So the city of Topeka is roughly according to the current census at 15.2% of people living in poverty, but we break that down, that's 23.4% of our black population, 16.9% Hispanic and 9.1% white. 
So definitely something needing to be addressed. We looked at data as well um, with use of force. Um, this was a discussion that was really brought up in 2020 and has been a continued um, discussion across the country, um, therefore. So this um, chart and data um, is from the Topeka uh, Police Department's year-end report that they published. They're really good about um, putting data out. Um, and so their 2020 report is here. And one thing that's really important is to also understand the breakdown of our population. So if we look just at the numbers, right, the numbers themselves are much higher for, for white um, interactions, but we do also have to understand that Topeka's population is 10.6% Black, 15.8% Hispanic, and 75.4% White. But when we break down this data, Black and Brown citizens are involved in 46% officer use of force incidents. And one number that I find pretty troubling as well is that 20% of those use of force incidents were mentally impaired individuals, not including individuals under the influence, which doubles. That's pretty pretty concerning. So when we look at these things, this is a way for self-reflection. This is a way to see numbers and recognize that there is a disparity and then review our policies and procedures. Where can we make some meaningful changes? Why um, are we seeing this um, happen more often? Should we be reviewing something differently? This is not ever something that is to poke fingers or point blame, right? It's a way to self-reflect, grow, and do better. That's a hard space for people to step over, right? It's a very hard space to not take um, the numbers and get really personal with that and say, well, we're not doing anything wrong, right? Like we, we don't do this and, and nobody feels this way. Um, we, we look at the numbers when we're doing funding or when we're doing this, but when we break it down, we still see there's a difference. And that's where that self-reflection and intentionality can be really helpful. I didn't want to start off with the really hard one. So infant mortality, the Healthy People 2030 goal is 5.0 deaths per 1,000 live births. In Topeka, Shawnee County, we're at 8.8. .8, so we are well above that, but even more so, Black and Hispanic babies are dying 14.8, 14.2 per 1,000 in our community. The 66604 zip code is the highest infant mortality rate by zip code in the entire state. That's where the research The entire state. The, the re, that's where, sorry, Dennis, what was that? That's where the research plant. The research plant. <laughs> yeah. So that's a hard thing to sit at. And many people I've talked to um, do not realize right? Like don't, couldn't believe that we have that here in our community. And there are a lot of factors to that, right? 66604 is a, a fairly large zip code, right? It's, it's a pretty big zip code. Um, yeah, we're here right now, Central Park, but if you, it also has a strip that goes all the way to like Gurish, right? But a small strip, but it goes across. So it's a fairly, fairly decent size um, zip code, but we know there are many factors that play a role in this. Um, an example, I had um, a, a family I was speaking with who um, just had a baby and was, um, we were having discussions about safe sleep practices. And she told me that um, eventually, right, it took a little bit of discussion where she said, well, I, I am sleeping with, with the baby. And through a little bit more discussion, found out that um, the two toddlers are also sleeping in bed with her. Um, and whew, if you met those toddlers, we definitely did not want them sleeping in bed. I don't know how she slept. Um, 
And so more discussion, and we find out she's only able to keep that one room warm. She was only able to afford to block off the windows, the draft, um, while living in, you know, a 700 square foot home was still having a $300 bill every month. She had to be very careful on how she warmed that house being um, someone whose husband was unable to work due to various injuries. She was caring for several babies and they had recently had some tragedy. Um, so they couldn't afford to winterize the rest of the house so she could keep that one room uh, warm. And so actually through some collaboration, even with the city, we were able to find more winterization kits, get her a safe sleep sack and a portable crib for her to put her baby in and still feel really comfortable with her being warm. Now, that is an example of some intersectionality of how policies, procedures, right, um, how those everyday social determinants of health are impacting people in a very basic way, right? Um, so there's lots of efforts and work being done um, on this. And it's a, um, a goal that has been there to decrease while most of the state has seen a decrease in infant mortality rates. We have not, we have not in our community. So what are some things that we can do? So um, if you were able to, there, there was a sheet that um, was passed out that has been developed um, that kind of discusses um, some action steps, right? So what are some things that, that us as people or organizations can really do to start making an impact. And part of that is doing that self-reflection work, right? Part of it is deciding that we need to make an effort to look at things that we have um, an impact on, whether that be you go back to an organization and say, you know what? I want us to develop some policies and procedures that are being intentional about looking at how we practice things or even in your every everyday life, right? Learning and growing more. I am learning more every single day. I am in no way an expert um, in, in any way and that constant, constant learning on how we can do and improve things. So there has definitely been some um, tactics that have been produced um, that are available on how that self-reflection really works, um, how we can um, be intentional, intentional with those five questions that we ask every time we're deciding on policy and procedure. You know, some really common things that occurred while we were reviewing some different policies at, at other organizations were nobody had really looked at this policy in a while, right? Like, oh goodness, like, yeah, that's that's problematic. We need to change it. When's the last time we looked at that? We, we probably need to be sure that we're reviewing every X number of years, right? So there are very unintentional things that are sitting places um, that once we, we decide that we're going to take a look and that we're gonna do better, um, we can make those changes. So co-signing the declaration, which you can reach by going to the website or the QR code. I did print several copies um, as well that you can pick up. Um, the Topeka Shawnee County numbers aren't very different, though two of them were produced when there was just a, a slight change in, in numbers. Um, basically, co-signing on is showing your support, right, by stating we, myself, my organization is going to be making this active change. We're going to be beginning this process so that when we keep moving forward to more organizations, the city, the county, and we're showing them that, look, our community has been taking the effort to do this work. Let's, let's just bring it. Let's just bring it all the way across the board, which we've got several um, entities, organizations that have taken um, these steps and have begun that process of self-reflection, and we just need more of that momentum. Um, self-reflection, like we talked about, there are many 
many groups within the community who are doing work, um, doing work in different ways. It might be, policy might not be your thing. That might not be exciting to you, um, but there are groups. Um, there is Heartland Healthy Neighborhoods, um, which is an, um, an organization um, that is grassroots led that um, addresses several different um, health impacts in our community. Um, they have a healthy eating, they have an active lifestyle, they have one addressing sexual health, drug abuse, mental health, food access, um, and healthy babies, healthy moms and healthy babies. Those volunteer groups um, meet every month to address the disparities within our community. There's been some pretty remarkable work about addressing food deserts. Um, they were instrumental in being able to work with like the farmer's market so that um, EBT or food stamps are accepted at the farmer's market um, and not only accepted, they're doubled, right? And so their group was pretty instrumental in that. Healthy Babies puts on a, um, a community baby shower every year. And we've had anywhere from 99 to, you know, a handful of mamas um, and dads and grandparents and caregivers show up to learn about safe sleep practices. And because of those um, partnering organizations, we were able to provide pack and plays, uh, wearable blankets and other goodies to go home. And we, we house that in the 04 zip code so that we're making impactful change, making things accessible to people. Because again, when we talk about transportation, right, we know that the bus runs every hour. Right. Um, we have um, child care um, problems. I had a family of five who rode the bus an hour to drop kids off at um, the only daycare she could find and then had to hop the bus to get to work. But you can't work eight hours because you're riding the bus so long. So you have to get back to get those kiddos, um, you know, four hours of riding the bus every day or waiting. So those barriers that we have that we don't see every day because of our privilege, right? That we're not experiencing can be forgotten about very easily unless we're intentionally looking at them. And the only way that we can be intentional is through self-reflection, bringing people to the table, going to people and asking what their needs are, right? We can try to decide all day long what might be helpful and what someone might need, but we don't know until we ask them, right? Because sometimes things that we provide can be a barrier. I remember one entity saying, well, we, we house these drives and we have these things and, and we, you know, people don't show up. Have you ridden the bus? Have you towed three kids on the bus for any reason? You know, in the cold, one with a car seat, a toddler meltdown, it's difficult. So we have to be able to decide that we are going to go to people, ask people their needs, bring them to the table, because that matters. And be a champion, right? So what you learn, what you do, talk about it, bring it up. Um, when you see the situations within a group and organization, when you see something that you can speak up about because you have the privilege to do so, that's how we keep this conversation going, right? Um, be involved in um, not only our state policies, but our local policies, right? Like lots of times we, we focus a lot on what's happening with the state legislature um, and, and forget that what happens locally is impacting our everyday lives, right? A, a lot of what happens at city council meetings and um, policies that are passed there are often with very good intentions, but sometimes need some advocacy and, and work for. Um, so being involved where you can, right? We all have those strengths of what we can provide and what we can do. So using that privilege of what we do know and what we can do, and also being willing to listen, right? Like we don't have all the answers and we certainly don't know how other people um, 
are, are living their lives and what can be helpful and useful. Um, you know, and, and having a, a conversation with a family once and, and, and an entity asking about, um, mental health care. Well, how do we get mental health care, you know, to black and brown communities without there just being this stigma, make it available, make it the thing that's just there that everyone has access to. When you live in a situation where the same thing has happened over and over and over again, without that access, you don't know that things could be differently. You don't know that, you know what, this isn't feeling right today. And I should probably, I should probably go, go get a checkup, right? Um, and when it's available, when it's accessible, when everyone can access it, that's the norm, right? It's a lot, a lot more complicated to the, than that, but I think you get, get my drift on it. So we isolated um, within these proclamations about 10 different stats that were um, most alarming, I think, that stuck out the most when um, this group was reviewing um, the data. So the data comes from um, the U.S. Census, Kansas Health Matters, other state entities that gather data and work like the Kansas Infant Mortality Review Board, right? Um, and one thing that happens within our community, um, if you're unaware, is the Community Health Improvement Plan. Okay, this was actually just released recently. Um, the Community Health Improvement Plan is where there's the breakdown of all of that, um, those different categories that we talked about and what that data looks like in our community, as well as what people are saying are important to them. So roundtable discussions and surveys um, also go into this work to develop goals and plans for our community. And then the action steps that can happen to um, improve the disparities that we see. Um, this is accessible online. The health department, Stormont Vale website, um, is, it's accessible there. Um, and it breaks down all of those priority areas and goals. So I really encourage you to take a peek at this to um, understand the status of health in our community. Because the way that this can be really helpful is one extra step to looking at how things are done to be intentional about making change. So whenever we have grants and policies, whenever we have things in place, we oftentimes have rules we have to follow, right? I've written grants for 20 years and, and yes, there's always the, the rules you have to follow, but we can always take it one step further. We can always take our local data and say, okay, I know here in this group, in this area, we have this happening. We have the data to back it up we're gonna be intentional about it here, which that sometimes does happen. But if we look at those health maps from even 50, 60 years ago about community and neighborhood health, hasn't changed much, hasn't changed much at all. So we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to recognize that we're not unique. This isn't a problem that doesn't happen here, that century old policies, practices, and procedures that have been in place have really set disparities in our community that are causing health consequences. I remember sitting here and Dr. Pizzino stating that currently in Shawnee County, back in 2017, I will tell you the number is not improved though with our local data, but back in 2017, he stated, that in Shawnee County, a black man is expected to live 11.79 years less than a white man born in Shawnee County. And our current potential years of life lost has not improved. As a matter of fact, there's more lives lost, years of lives lost than there are uh, black people in our community. Not improved. So we have an, uh, an obligation to be intentional about these numbers, but we, we need to recognize them. So that is, <laughs> that is the basics. I know I could go on and on and on, and I, I was very 
purposeful to um, not throw in all the data there. And, and you can certainly look that up along with um, at the back of the, the declaration, some action steps um, that are intentional about policy and decision making um, and are not like super big things. It's not something anyone has to pay money to do. Um, making these intentional changes are, are not costly. Um, it um, will only improve our community when everyone's health is improved. 